So, uh, hello everybody and welcome to the fourth in our series of Digital Preservation Awards winners webinars. Uh, my name is Sarah Middleton and I'm the Head of Communications and Advocacy for the Digital Preservation Coalition. Um, I'm very happy to introduce this session now. So, um, for those of you who have been participating in the other sessions in this series, you'll know about the Digital Preservation Awards, but some of you might be a, a little less familiar. So, I'll do a quick, uh, quick run through. Um, so, the Digital Preservation Awards are um, a celebration which happens every two years in order to recognise the achievements of people and organisations who've made significant and innovative contributions to securing our digital legacy for the long term. And that happens across five categories. So we've got research and innovation, we've got teaching and communications, we've got the most distinguished work, uh, student uh, work in digital preservation, uh, we've got the most outstanding digital preservation initiative in commerce, industry and the third sector, and we have the, uh, an award for safeguarding the digital legacy. And in this series, we're hearing from each of our winners uh, to learn a bit more about their work and their projects. And today, it's the turn of uh, the Crossrail and Transport for London team with their archiving Crossrail projects. And they were the winners of the most outstanding digital preservation in commerce, industry, and the third sector. Um, so, Crossrail is Europe's biggest infrastructure project uh, at £14.8 billion. Pounds. It started in 2008 and over the following 10 years has integrated the information, largely digital, uh, developed from over 25 main design contracts, 30 advanced work contracts and 60 plus logistics and main works contracts. So Crossrail has embraced BIM, building information and modelling, with a single set of linked applications shared with contractors across all phases of the project. And the challenge for the archive team has been to preserve a heavily interlink interlinked data set without having to retain legacy software and I'm, we're going to hear all about that today. Um, and it wasn't just the judges who were impressed with the scale and the complexity and the achievements of this project. Um, the DPC members had a vote too and I picked out some of the reasons they gave for voting for the Crossrail project as the winner in this category. Um, they said it was really fascinating to read about the challenge of archiving this vast amount of data in a standard and reusable fashion. Definitely an example for the archiving of other big infrastructural projects and others to follow, so thumbs up. Uh, another one said, this project seems like it has direct relevance to many communities struggling to manage and preserve complex data. It touches many points of the life cycle, not just the end stage, making it a practical use in record-keeping environments as well as archival institutions. So lessons to be learned across the board, I think. So I'm, I'm really keen to hear from Alistair, uh, from Cathy, Saran and Will um, about the Archiving Crossrail project. So I'm going to hand over to you now, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, so I'm Alistair Goodall. I'm head of IT. In the room also, we've got Cathy Groom, application developer, Saran Mirenberg, our solutions architect, and Will Vogley, the application development lead. Um, we haven't got that many slides, so we're just going to sort of Canter through quickly, really expanding a bit on what Sarah said. Um, and then what we'll do is show you a demo of the, the system and, and the archive data. Um, so, exactly said, the, the challenge for us really was um, it's relatively easy when you've got the project and all the information flowing around, and we'll show you that um, and, and the BIM context. The challenge then comes at the end of it, and you know, we are approaching the end phase of Crossrail. Obviously, it's been in the news, um, so you know, the go-live's been delayed, but we are still archiving data now. So we have shut some systems down. The archive is there, it's receiving data in a staggered process. Um, I've put a couple of links in this. Um, do have a look at the Learning Legacy site. Um, not so much about the archive, but there's a lot of stuff on there about BIM and the project and so on. So, this, um, I mean, it, you won't be able to see this in, in detail on your screen, but um, just to explain this. So the, the project, so the Crossrail team is basically there to project manage. Um, so we have tier one, tier two contractors. They're the ones doing the digging, the building, and so on. Our job is to manage it. And any major project is broken into a number of pillars. So we've got health and safety, 
cost management, schedule, risk, finance, and so on. Each of these vertical pillars has a number of systems in support it. So each of the boxes represents a different system. Um, at our heart, we, we have this particular system called EB, Enterprise Bridge. Um, it's quite old now, but that's the system that is running our contract administration, document management, and so on. Um, so as with any big organization, there is no one single system that holds the truth. There is a whole host of them, and you know, they talk to each other to a lesser, greater extent. They share master data, and, and this is the sort of the BAU state. The BIM piece, which um, the Crossrail technical team have sort of taken a lead on, really, the big difference for that with us is by making everybody, and, and it, you know, to the extent it was the case initially of making everyone work in the same space, we were able to avoid a lot of the corruption and um, data issues that happen when you start passing bits of paper from one team to another, from one contractor to another. So we make all of our users and contractors work within uh, project-wise, in our case the CAD drawings, and EB for all of our business workflows, document management, and so on. And that's really how we interpreted BIM. So we made everyone work on a shared data set. And it, you know, with the sheer number of contractors, um, contracts, third parties, it was the only way to do it. It's really good for when we're mid-project, but when we come to the archive, it causes a lot of challenges. So this was all of our vertical stacks. As we come to the end, um, so we've got the, the sort of stack of data in here and applications and so on. As with every major project and, and, and everyone delivering something, the finished product, the end asset and its metadata, the end document, all gets moved across to the relevant um, people who are running it afterwards. So London Underground, the Elizabeth Line, Well for London, and Transport for London. They are all picking up the final snapshot, the final operation and maintenance manual, the final set of asset data, the final design document. We're then moving some um, data over lock, stock, and barrel. So our mapping data, our finance data, those systems are actually just moving into TFL. But the gap the archive fills, and this is the bit that I think um, hasn't particularly been done to this extent before, is the archive provides the context. And you see it, basically you need it when something goes wrong. So, um, you know, you, you see it in the news with things like Piper Alpha, with the Croydon tram disaster. When something goes wrong, you need to know why did they make those decisions? What was the logic behind it? What was the reasoning leading up to this finished product? And that's what the archive is there to do. So, by transforming all of these different applications and data sources into a single unified state, very simple to use front end, we provide that context. The other bit that we do is we meet the legislative requirements, so we have to preserve some of this data, it might relate to respiratory issues and so on, um, for up to 40 years. And it also gives an amazing opportunity for mining the data. So by taking all of the information out of the various systems, putting it into a single place, you allow um, data scientists and so on down the line to look across all of it, cross-reference it, and see stuff that we didn't see maybe while we were in the middle of the project. Um, and that's sort of the exciting opportunity. So the archive is this one-off snapshot um, of all of the data, all of the context and so on. It's as we wind systems down, and Will will be demonstrating one of the systems, we are putting it into the archive. So it is growing as, as we go along. Um, I mean, the other interesting challenge brought about by BIM was this handback to contractors. Um, so 
obviously a, a, a byproduct, which I think we didn't really, well, if I, if I go back 10 years, the original contracts for all of our contractors required them to provide Crossrail with a copy, um, I think it was either hard copy or on CD, of all data provided to Crossrail. It didn't make sense in a BIM world. So in a BIM world, all of the interactions and transactions are actually on our systems. So we had to find a way to give that back um, to the individual contractors. And that was a separate project. In terms of the archive itself, so the, the key requirements, it was intuitive to use. And feeding on from that, no application specific knowledge required. And what we mean by that is when you're in the middle of a project, you've got an army of people who are there to um, support the systems, understand it both from an IT perspective and from a end user um, application team perspective. All of those people are going and the, the, the system that we're going to demonstrate, um, our titles management bit of the archive, the people who are responsible for that in Crossrail have now gone. Um, so that's a key bit is, you know, previously archiving was done a little bit by giving a USB stick to somebody, the keys to an application to somebody else, and very quickly the understanding of how it all fitted together degrades. So by the sort of second iteration of handover of people leaving, it, it's lost knowledge. So we had to get rid of that. We had to make it that what we leave behind doesn't need us to understand. Um, and, and that's what that hopefully we'll be able to show you. Um, so to support that, also we needed this simple portable data format across the entire archive. And really, um, you know, all, all of my team were all SQL people born and bred. And, you know, we, we were sort of introduced to this new world of NoSQL and JSON. Um, and it is a far more portable, far more simple to understand format. Um, so we will, we will sort of talk about that. Then obviously BIM was linking everything. So Will will show you when he shows you titles management, how the process of recording our titles needs three, four different systems. Um, it's okay when all those systems are up and running because you can jump across them with links and so on. We had to convert all of those links into this, this single format. Um, and then finally, you know, as with, with everyone, we had to really think about GDPR, think about just good practice for data preservation, um, and also think about it as if we were archivists, not as if we were IT people. So IT people, we like keeping stuff, we like putting it on hard disks and servers, and we back it up forever. Archivists, you know, we're sort of learning, is about curating, not keeping stuff that you shouldn't be keeping, and keeping it for only for as long as you need to be. So this was the sort of the challenge, um, and as we put at the bottom, and as obviously has become very public now, timing and sequencing is a key challenge to manage. So I think at the time that we were putting in our submission, we, we were still saying that we were going to be on time. Um, obviously, that's now not the case. Um, so we are delivering late as a project. But the good bit about the archive is that it supports that. It supports a gradual feeding in of information. Um, and that's a, a sort of a key feature. So what we're going to talk to you about in a sec, and what I'm going to I'm hand over to Will for, is our one bit of the archive. So if you remember, I showed you all of those little boxes. Something between 20 and 30 systems are going into this archive. This is one of them, the titles management system. So Crossrail, and apologies, I, I missed this. But, you know, for those of you who don't know, we're building a railway um, going east to west under London. Um, and to do that, you have to acquire a lot of land. So we have to acquire land for work sites that we then hand back. There's an awful lot of process around parceling up land, um, 
handing it over to contractors, taking it back from contractors, and then ultimately giving it back to the original owners or to oversight development. So we had something like 900 million pounds worth of acquired land, um, custodianship over 5 million square meters. So although you know the, the, the bit that's in all the TV programs and so on is a tunnel, it's really big and exciting, there's a lot of work above ground to make that happen. So for our titles management, we have GIS, we have mapping, we've got the actual titles management, the recording of who owns what, estates management, so we have to then manage the, the land um, from a sort of rent perspective and so on, possibly from a security, and then document management. There's an awful lot of formal documentation that goes through this process. And the, the live, and all of this is on our Learning Legacy website, so you can see the steps that we're talking about. But the sort of the live process, just to sort of quickly explain what the business process was, was that the land and property team would create a draft title, a draft ownership of a chunk of land. The GIS team would then create the geometry on a mapping system. The land and property team would approve that within the mapping system. They would then open up the titles management system and begin the registration. So this is now our second system involved. When they were done with it, they would send it to the land registry. That's the UK body responsible for all of this. Um, then when we get back the documentation to approve the transfer from land registry, we would update the title management system with all of the information. Um, finally, we would put in the registration title um, and addition dates. All of this is very specific to a land registry process. Um, then we would put a link to the formal document, which we would put into our document management system. And then we finish up in our title management. So the actual process, if you were in the field of estate management, you would understand perfectly. You would get what we're talking about. Um, but from, a, from an end user perspective, this is the same in, in every business. This single business process is jumping across three, four different systems. And for as long as those three to four different systems are up and running, um, we're okay. But for the archive, we have to pull all of these into one piece. So this is the bit that um, the archive needs to deal with. So when we build this, we have to try and stitch, stitch together these systems and put them into a single place. So I think this is the last one before I show you the demo before Will does. So for the archive, just the titles management system, and, and this was the same process across all our systems. First thing we've got to do is define the core transaction. So from an end user viewpoint, what is the key business transactions, business objects for this process? Then for each process, we look at it from the user screen or the user report and we label up every single field and we identify where does that field come from. Having done that, we effectively reverse engineered the system. We then got to identify which fields are going to be searchable and we're not going to particularly talk about the, the sort of the detailed technical piece, but we can answer questions via email and so on afterwards. Um, but the out-of-the-box search capabilities in, in modern cloud. So we were using Cosmos DB, for the JSONs, and Azure Search for the search is incredible. So we, we gain um, you know, consumer-style search front-end, map-style search front-end, pretty much out-of-the-box. Um, having done this, we then got to work out personal data security classifications, We've then got everything we need to write, um, as I said we're a SQL shop, to write the SQL to just output the JSONs. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what a JSON looks like. Then we suck those into our archive system based in Cosmos, update the Azure search index. So we say, right, we've, I've put this data in for these transactions, search on these fields. Um, and then Will and the team create the display objects within the archive framework and the menu items to support it. 
So just, you know, the, the screens on the, on the number one here, this is a, what the application looks like, not particularly beautiful, but it's a job. And you can see here, we've labeled up every single field. So that's how we know we got the data. Then this is our mapping table. So for each field, where does it come from? What's the source? And then finally, I mean, you can't see this properly in detail on your screens, but this is JSON. So it's a really simple human readable format. It's just what they call key value pairs. So every line here is a label, what am I, and then a value or a set of values. Um, and it lends itself really well to describing um, business processes. So, and then, so yes, and the, the question that's just come in is, did we do this process um, prior to the project initiation or once the activities were underway? And it's a real shame that we did all of this at the end. So we did all of this at the end of the project um, when we had to build the archive. And, and then as part of the archive, we did it. If we'd done this at the start, um, we would have had the most amazing description of our business processes as we, as we went along. And we would have been able to archive as we went along. We can maybe touch on that at the end. So that, a bit cantering through, but, but that was the challenge. So how to turn very specialist bespoke systems that need an army of people to support and are now 10 years old into something that someone who is a subject matter expert but not an application expert can understand. Um, so what I'm going to do, just bear with us for a minute or so, I'm just going to hand over to Will, who will open up his session. Um, just while we're, so Will's just opening up the remote desktop. Um, cool. So I will now hand over to Will, who will do the talk. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I thought I'd do is show you a demo from the perspective of how somebody would actually use the archive. So typically this would be somebody in uh, TFL's information governance. Uh, a query may come in, a re request for freedom of information, that type of thing, and they would have to use the archive to try and um, meet the request or the requirement. So what I'll do, just as an example, touching on the subject of our titles management system, is um, create a fake scenario. Perhaps somebody challenged um, whether Crossrail owned a piece of land or not. So maybe they got a fictitious request from a character called Jason Bourne, for example, who queries as to whether uh, a bit of land really does belong to Crossrail. Um, so what would they do? How would somebody go about using the archive to query that and find the information they want when they've got no real prior knowledge of the original systems the data come from? So hopefully you can all see the screen. If you can't, I do apologize, but um, bear with me. So what I'll do is start off with a, so this is a list of some of the applications that we've migrated into the archive. The titles management system is one of them. Um, so all I've got to go on is a person's name at the moment, somebody called Jason Bourne, who's querying or disputing land ownership. So what I'm gonna do is start off with a global archive search just to see if I can find anybody of that name. So let's have a look and see if we can find anyone. So this is going to search all of the data sets in the archive and see if it can find a match on this particular one. Um, hopefully it doesn't take too long. Um, so the, the, the hit at the top is the, a record that matches what I'm searching for. So let me go in and have a look and see what we've got for this person. And it's a, a TMS party, a Titles Management System party um, that had an interest down here, at the bottom of a title component. So this was an area of land that this person used to have an interest in and is probably disputing the fact that they still have that. Um, so I found the person and I've got a postcode. Um, so I'm, let's see what I can find out um, regarding this postcode and where it is. I've also got an address, a house number, number 95, 
and it's in a place called Abbey Grove. That's what I've got so far. And I've also got a reference to a TMS title component, which is a land parcel, which I'll show you a bit more about now. So what I could do is go over and try and perform a search on the maps. So I could go with the postcode and see what it shows me to get an idea of where this piece of land is. So let's see if we can find anything there. And it's uh, taken me into this place and it's in the right place. It's Abbey Grove. So purely from a postcode, I've got a location on the map and I can see I've got some geometry spatial data here, uh, a combination of title components and titles. And we did have a reference to a title component. So what I can do is see if I can find that title component in here. And I think it was 4973. And there's a type of component that was related to that person called Jason Bourne. And I don't know if you can see it, but up in here, a little white uh, dot has shown up on the map. Let me zoom in a bit. So this is showing where this particular title component is. And I can see that. So I, I'm going to go in and have a look and see what I can find out about this. So this is data that's come from the Titles Management System. We're looking at spatial data that came from an Oracle system that's all been merged together in the archive. Um, I've got a, an archive item here, so I'm going to go in and have a look and see if I can find out a bit more about it. So it's a title component that was used, and sure enough, Jason Bourne was a party that was interested in that title, or that particular component, and it forms a registered title, it did at one point, and it looks like some notices were sent to him as part of the land acquisition process, and we do have a title that this land component now belongs to. So this is a reference to a registered title, and it has lots of title components, one of them being the piece of land that Jason Bourne is querying. I've also got links to the transactions that took place, the acquisition process, I can see there are some documents also, and now these would be stored in our EB system, the document management system, and scrolling down, I can see there's actually a land registry document. So this document will probably prove uh, ownership of the land. Um, the EB isn't in the archive at the moment, but I went round the houses earlier on to try and find it, and Sure enough, if I can get to my desktop. And just while Will's doing this, so all of the screens that you're seeing, um, in, a, in a normal application, each one will be sort of handcrafted for that particular thing. But what these are doing is just displaying the underlying JSON. So it's a very generic user interface, which then copes really well with 20, 30 different data sources. So effectively, the screens that you're seeing, the, the map ones are displaying GIS data, the, the other ones are displaying the, the underlying JSONs. So it's a very powerful interface because we don't rewrite it um, in, in sort of great detail for each different data type that's going in there. It, um, it's it's the same approach for each one. Is that a yeah? Yeah, pretty much everything's done in the same way. There's a standard structure, a standard framework for storing the data, retrieving the data, searching for it. Um, ultimately, I found the document that proves that Crossrail did purchase this piece of land, including that particular bit of land that Jason Bourne was querying. Um, so that's like an example of how the archive might be used. Um, and we've got all our other systems in here, like I said, that we've migrated. So that's obviously just a, to give you a glimpse of, you know, not knowing much at the beginning other than just a person's name, I've been able to navigate to find a location on a map to find the document that related to that and the process that was used to um, actually register the title. And that's, I mean, that's, you know, it, the, the, the look and the feel we were trying to emulate a sort of well, the, the directive for me, for me was Amazon. Other sites are available. But 
very much just the, the filters, that was the filtering, the, the facets. So in the same way that you can type you know, something into Amazon with millions of products and then straight away start to narrow it down on the left-hand side by departments and so on, that's exactly what, what the team have done here. And it works whatever the data source, whether it's titles data, document data, contract data, it's exactly the same. Um, so that's the sort of, um, you know, that, that's the demo. So we can turn it over to um, questions. I think one of the bits just to sort of touch on, which was, you know, before we throw it to questions, was, was lessons learned. Um, and we, we've had a question in on chat, of, you know, just saying, well, when did you start this and did you plan it all beforehand and so on? Um, and the sort of honest answers would be too late and no. Um, so effectively, it was never planned or budgeted that we needed to archive stuff or how to do it or anything like that. As we came towards, um, you know, what we thought was the end of the project, so there was legislative requirements to keep data for a period of time, particularly health and safety data, data relating to asbestos and so on. That gave us the the wedge, if you like, to say we need to do something. Um, there was no budget to do it, um, but by using the existing team that understood the systems, they were able to translate the legacy systems into this new format. Then the sort of the advent of cloud and its um, you know, very cheap data storage, very powerful search capabilities, um, that really made it possible to then do this, this unified approach. Um, if you had time again, or if you were an enduring organization, then having all of your core business transactions described in a consistent way into a consistent system that is highly searchable must be a good thing. Um, but we didn't do this until the end. So, yeah, are there any other, any questions or queries, either by chat or? Yes, exactly. So someone's saying statutory and regulatory compliance. Um, yeah, that, if it wasn't for that, then this, you know, this data set of an entire project over 10 years would have been thrown to multiple different systems, you know, laptops handed over to people, and it, and it would get lost within a couple of iterations of, you know, teams on the other side. I mean, just to, to add to that, um, so on our original proof of concept, I think Will and Kathy came along and did a demo to some of the, uh, let's say, the power users of our of our applications. Um, and actually what they found is it was much easier to find data in this system than the originating systems as well. And although we're looking at this as an archive, um, if we're looking at a much bigger picture and similar to what Alice was saying, if we were to do this earlier, benefits could be realized much sooner than regulatory, regulatory and statutory requirements came in, um, actually allowing a business to go and not have to necessarily know where uh, a particular team stores this information. They can just go and find it. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's a lesson learned there. I think that's a great message um, and something that, that we could sort of if we could share that across all organization types and um, not just kind of construction and um, infrastructure businesses uh, like, like this and projects like this, but I think it's something that could be taken away and applied um, to, to organizations of any, any type. So thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, are there any other questions for uh, the team? Um, hi, it's Jen Mitchum from the DPC. I've got a question. Um, I was, I'm really fascinated by, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there, is there actually no file formats really in this archive apart from JSON? Yeah. The, the concept of file uh, formats redundant here. So the, the, uh, the archive is, um, so the Cosmos, the, the database that, that all um, is JSON files, JSON objects. So every business transaction, be it a particular, Title request, be it a parcel land, 
is described in a JSON format. Um, so it's the world of NoSQL. I don't fully understand it, um, but it it provides you with um, yeah. That there are no table structures. You define your JSON structure. Um, then you put the Azure search on top of it and say, make this field fully searchable, this field fully searchable. Then, you know, we're a 10-year-old project, so we've got an awful lot of um, the old way of doing it, which was Word documents, Excel documents, PDF documents. You know, we, we've moved more to pure data, but all of those files are then stored in blob storage, and they are fully searchable. Um, but yes, there are no, um, no. I mean, you know, well, there are no SQL databases, no tables. No, no, it's all schemaless um, data storage within uh, Cosmos DB, basically. Um, so, the, you know, the maintenance is pretty much taken care of itself. It's, you know, the system um, optimizes its own performance anyway. Um, so it's really fast, especially the search service, and we can search through hundreds of thousands of files a specific name and it will get hits for us very very quickly um, so it helps you find old documents that you need as well um, as long as it's in one of the formats that it's supported by the search service which is most common I think like office documents Excel Word text PDFs and so on okay interesting so even that um, like you showed on the demo there was something that looked like a GIS file but that that isn't actually a file. It's not a shape file anymore. It's no, just that, um, a, that, that information is stored as GeoJSON yeah, within okay. Cosmos DB. Yeah. Ah. So do you, do you think that you'll have to to migrate the data into a different format in the future, or is JSON? Um, would it be more a case of migrating the system? So when your application um, was no longer working properly, you'd you'd retain that JSON data and just create a new system that read it. Absolutely, yeah. That, I think the fact that it's in a format that's very portable, yeah. you know, you, you don't have to change from SQL to Oracle. You just have a standard data set that can be, you can put any type of front end over that. Um, so it, it, you know, it, like, it, as time moves on and technology has changed, the JSON format will still be there and still be supported for many years to come, I'm sure. So if you do need to, change your front end, your, you know, your search mechanism, the, the raw data is still there in a format that's very readable and portable. And it's human readable. I mean, if you sort of compare it to XML is difficult to read as a human, whereas JSON is literally label value, label value. Okay. I've, I've, it's something I've heard of, but I've never really um, it's kind of gone into it in any depth. But it sounds very interesting. Thank you. I think for something like this, where you are trying to describe objects and transactions from a wide array of systems, I, th I think it's incredibly powerful. Um, it, it takes away the onus of having to predefine what your data will look like for, for the rest of its lifetime. Um, it gives you the flexibility. So where we say JSON is schemaless, it's, it, it's, it's not entirely true. You define your schema, but where the schemaless part comes in is that it's not fixed and changing it isn't going to break the you know the, the data or the integrity of the data um, so you have the flexibility to adapt and mold your data as your organization grows and different requirements come in or change um, and that's really why this was a good fit for us because we are describing so many different objects that we wouldn't be able to do on a on a traditional SQL database that we'd have to predefine everything beforehand. And then when you combine it with search, you you get a sweet spot um, because you know the out of the box. I mean, we, you know we're using Azure, you know AWS is around as well. But when you leverage the you know the out of the box box search algorithms across this mountain of JSON data, it is. As Will said, incredibly fast, incredibly powerful, um, and you just you can't compete with the sort of the search algorithms and so on that they've developed. I mean, it's you know it's si similar, I assume, search algorithm algorithms to those that are powering Bing, Google, and so on. Um, it, it's a very very powerful combination. 
Mm. I think it's great that um, you did think, talk about being IT people and trying to think like an archivist. Um, but I think it, it's it's really great to have that kind of IT perspective because I think you've come up with a solution that um, an archivist wouldn't have been able to come up with. And um, it, I guess it shows the, the power of, of needing um, needing IT people around the table when you're building systems or, or thinking about how best to um, deal with data like this. We'll take that, thank you. <laughs> Any more questions uh, for the team? If you haven't got a mic or anything, don't worry, you can pop, them, pop the questions in the chat box. I mean, yeah, well, it's the other, you know, so this, this whole solution is, is cloud based. Um, there are no servers. Um, the whole solution, and it's a bit techie, sorry, but you know, the whole solution is using things as a service. Um, so, and, and that's the, you know, this is part of the big cloud revolution is we don't have to have people monitoring servers. We don't have to have people monitoring databases. Um, we pay X amount a month and it's not a lot um, for a Cosmos DB service. We pay for a web service um, and that, eliminates a huge amount of overhead that would, ex would have existed in the past around a system like this where you just need to pay an army of IT people to keep the show on the road. Um, so it's a, it's a very different world that's possible now with these cloud services. And you know the, the map functionality that Will was showing, um, this is you know, all provided out of the box, I mean, he's had to write the code to leverage it, but that's only going to improve. So as you know, Microsoft develops that particular bit, we will get the benefits through into this, into this solution. Similarly, as they improve their search algorithms, we will pick up on that. So yeah, the plan for managing the long term. So. Um, there, there are two aspects to this. So the first is that, so we're a, a room of IT people and we, we, it was a journey for us to learn what a room of archivists mean. Your timescales are very different to ours. Um, so the system itself um, is being written in a very light way. So we have, we have deliberately avoided complexity to make it easy for an IT team to just keep on the road. It's all cloud-based. The, the JSON format where all the data is is very portable. And in you know, 50, 100 years, you would still be able to look at a JSON format and understand what on earth it was going on about. Um, the underlying PDF documents, Word documents, those will degrade. Um, and the archive team, so they're, they're not on the call with us, but we are handing this over to the uh, Transport for London um, information governance team and they are professional archivists so over time they will shut things down in this they will cherry pick out the documents they will move into their longer term storage and they will take responsibility for making sure that PDF documents can still be opened word documents can still be opened and so on I think that the the value of the data set as a whole um, so this, this, you know, 10 years worth of data in a single format in a single place, um, the value of that to data scientists will be high initially and then, you know, probably within 15 years will be much, much lower. So I think in terms of the, the data sets, we're okay. The key bits that they need to pull out and cherry pick, um, that's what the, the archive team will be responsible for. So we haven't taken it to the, um, you know, the, the, the full extent. And there are already systems out there that will handle PDFs over their lifespan and so on. What, what we've done is at least preserved the information that was spread across, I mean, they're all SQL 2008, because that's how old we are, um, all of those databases and turned it into a format that is portable. Thank <laughs> you. 
Great, thank you. Um, it feels like we're kind of wrapping up. I don't know, we've got, probably got time for another question um, if anybody else has one. Um, otherwise, it looks like you, you might be off the hook. Sure, I mean, the bits we haven't shown you, so what Will's written and Kathy's written is there's a whole user front end whereby a user can select information, export it, they will then get um, PDFs of the JSON files, um, any attachments. So there is a, a front end around it to allow users to export the data, security around that so we can say who can, who can't. Um, we will look to put whatever we can of this solution into um, the public domain, obviously just make sure about security and so on. Um, Access the information itself, so the, the project repository, that's through the TFL information governance team. So the solution we will make as public as we can. Um, the data itself, so this particular instance of the solution, would be through TFL information governance. Great. And we're, you know, for as long as we're here, we're happy to talk about it. Fantastic. I, I, um, I've shared the link as well to the learning legacy uh, uh, area. Um, that you, you talked about earlier, um, documents as well. I think that's that's uh, great that you were able to share that too. So I think that'll be really interesting. I think you'll get a lot of people looking at that um, as well. So thank you. I think uh, <laughs> all round. Um, shall we wrap it up there then? If, if there are any more questions, if people want to uh, email uh, the team afterwards, then um, do you want to put your email addresses back? On. Can you go back to that front slide um, and then people can uh, get in touch if they want to. Um, and meanwhile, uh, I'll let you know that uh, we'll share links and things, we'll share the recording uh, to the of the webinar probably tomorrow but definitely by the end of the week. Um, and we're back again uh, on the 13th of March this time next week with our final session of the series. And we're going to be hearing from Cassandra O'Connell and the team at the IFI, Irish Film Archive, about their Loopline project. So, um, yeah, that's great. Your uh, email address is all up there now. So, um, if there are any more questions, please do get in touch with the team there. Um, otherwise, thank you all. Thanks, um, Alistair, Kathy, Saran, Will, for joining us today. Um, and we'll hopefully see you all again next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs>